Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're going to be discussing the incredibly sad story of Garnett Spears, who was a five-year-old little boy that tragically lost his life after he was poisoned with salt. Now, there's great debate about exactly how this occurred, and today I want to talk about what happened to him and my thoughts on the case. I won't lie, learning about everything Garnett had to go through was incredibly difficult, and I found myself so angry throughout the process because because this was senseless. Also, I want to say that I will do my very best to remain unbiased throughout the video so that you can form your own opinion. However, that's incredibly difficult for me to do given all of the details that I know about this case. In addition to Garnett's life and death, we'll also be discussing his mother's life in great detail because as you may have guessed, she plays a large role in the story. In order to understand the whole story, I feel that it's important to begin at the beginning. All right, let's dive right in. Lacey Elizabeth Spears was born to her parents parents Tina and Terry on October 16th, 1987. She was the youngest of their three children and was actually born while the family was living on the Castle Air Force Base that used to be located in Atwater, California. Shortly after Lacey was born, the base closed and Terry made the decision to retire from the military for good. It was then that the Spears relocated their family from California to Decatur, Alabama so that they could be close to Terry's parents. Decatur, Alabama is a small town consisting of approximately 50 55,000 people. It's considered a poor town located in the heart of the Bible Belt. Nicknamed the River City, it's nestled along the Tennessee River. The Spears could only be described as ordinary on the surface. Terry got a job working as an aircraft mechanic while Tina stayed home and tended to the house and the children. They did okay for themselves financially, though they were by no means rich. The three Spears children, Daniel, Rebecca, and Lacey, split up their summers between Clearwater, Florida, and Scott Kentucky. Tina's mother and brother lived in Clearwater and the kids enjoyed spending their days wandering the beaches and scuba diving with their uncle. While in Kentucky with Terry's wealthy and prominent family, they spent their days playing on the farm and learning how to milk the cows. But like any family, the Spears had their own issues under the surface. Tina and Terry both suffered from medical issues that played a large role in their lives. Tina had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes prior to Lacey's birth, while Terry was not only partially deaf, but suffered a great deal of pain due to having developed both celiacs and Crohn's disease. In addition to their medical issues, there seemed to always be issues within their marriage as well. Tina has actually been described as cold toward her children and by other family members. In childhood, Lacey could be described as a typical child. She loved to play dress up and house and she always wanted to play the mother. She was also completely obsessed with dolls and carried them around with her everywhere she went. She had multiple American Girl dolls which she would wash, dress, and treat like they were real children. She took the mother role very seriously and this phase lasted well into her middle school days. One day, she told her best friend Jessica that they were too old to play with dolls and that was that. Lacey was the teacher's pet and always maintained good grades. Her teachers remember her handing in her work early because she was so eager to please them and craved the attention that it got her. Socially, she didn't do as well. Classmates describe her as kind of socially awkward and standoffish, and she was extremely quiet. She did manage to make a few friends though, one of them being a little girl named Mallory. The two of them became best friends in kindergarten, and they would frequently play together at Mallory's house. Mallory's mother had some reservations about the Spears family, and didn't allow her daughter to play at their house. One day, after the girls had been begging for months, she went against her better judgment and allowed Mallory to go to the Spears' house one afternoon. The two girls played all afternoon, but while playing with their dolls, Lacey allegedly pushed Mallory to the ground out of nowhere, got on top of her, and started strangling her. Mallory was scared, and the attack was so bad that she had bruises on her neck when her mom picked her up. Lacey was obviously no longer allowed to go to Mallory's house, and she didn't really make another friend until the third grade, when she met Jessica. Jessica and Lacey have remained lifelong friends, and she describes Lacey as happy and outgoing. Their friendship started to change in the seventh grade, when Lacey showed up at Jessica's house disheveled and upset. Jessica's mother, Lisa, went outside and spoke with Lacey, and was shocked by what she heard. 
Lacey claimed that she had been assaulted by a family member and was scared to go home. Lisa was completely mortified and immediately contacted the police as well as the Department of Human Resources. Despite her report, no investigation was opened and no action was taken. Lisa was outraged by this and took Lacey in and let her move in for a few weeks. Jessica was unaware of what was going on, but she and Lacey were thrilled to be together every day. Something that Lisa thought was strange is that Lacey started calling her mom after only a few days. Eventually, Lacey was forced to go home and she never mentioned what happened to Jessica. She did tell her next door neighbor, however, who felt extremely terrible for her. They gave Lacey the green light to come over to their house anytime that she needed to and she took them up on that offer. She often snuck out of her house in the middle of the night and would stay over there for hours on end. Lacey found yet another safe place when she was around 14 years old when she began attending a Baptist church near her home. It was a fresh start and an opportunity to make new friends. She joined the softball team and made friends with other kids at the church, which she was very happy about. Neither Tina or Terry were attending the church, so Lacey had to find a ride home with a family that lived nearby. They began picking her up and dropping her off for church services, as well as the softball game. It only took a few weeks before Lacey began calling Paula, who was the mother, mom, and that made Paula extremely uncomfortable. She thought it was quite strange the way Lacey clung to her so quickly. It raised some red flags and made her hyper aware of Lacey's behavior. After the mom incident, she started noticing lies that Lacey would tell her for seemingly no reason. Paula, who was obviously an adult, could easily see through Lacey's lies and she began noticing a pattern. She noticed that Lacey would tell an elaborate and wild story about things that supposedly happened to her and then wait for a reaction from people. If Lacey didn't get a big enough of a reaction, she would come back with an even bigger story the following week. One Sunday, the woman noticed that Lacey had an ankle brace on, claiming that she hurt herself while cheerleading. When no one paid it much attention, she changed her story the following week. She then told everyone that she collapsed in the street because she was weak from not eating enough for days on end due to an eating disorder. When someone said that they had seen her eating during the time she claimed that it happened, she admitted that she had eaten, but said that food was all she had. People were concerned for her well-being, and Lacey told them she was receiving treatment for the eating disorder and she was seeing a therapist, none of which was true. And the stories only seemed to get more elaborate. In the eighth grade, Lacey told members of the church and friends that she was pregnant by her family member. Once again, Paula thought that it was a lie and began asking Lacey more questions about her situation. Situation. She asked her what exactly she planned to do, and Lacey told her that she didn't know at first. The following week, they picked Lacey up for church, and she claimed she had an abortion at a nearby medical center that Paula knew for a fact didn't offer those services. When caught in the lie, Lacey changed her story and claimed that she had done it in Florida. It really bothered Paula that Lacey could so easily come up with another lie to cover up the first one, and that stuck with her. People eventually started to see more red flags and grew suspicious suspicious of anything Lacey said. When people challenged her, she eventually stopped attending the church. Throughout high school, Lacey remained a good student and once again fed off of the attention of her teachers. She joined the choir, the drama club, and the, the family career and community leaders of America, as well as the future business leaders of America. Despite being an overachiever and a people pleaser, she and Jessica drifted apart when Lacey started hanging out with a different crowd. She began to experiment with various diets pills and Adderall because she was striving to be perfect. Despite the good girl persona, Lacey made it well known that she wanted to be a mother even in high school. She took a job at a fast food joint called Jack's Burgers where she worked part time. It was there that she met her first boyfriend whom she dated for a brief time. Lacey graduated in 2006 and shortly after she and Rebecca moved out of Terry and Tina's house and into an apartment together. Not long afterwards she tried to fulfill her baby fever any way that she could. She started volunteering in the nursery at Parkview Baptist Church in Decatur. There, she was responsible for caring for infants during church services. During the time that she was volunteering, Lacey became incredibly attached to a little boy 
that was in the nursery named Charlie. She gave him a little too much attention. And once his mother figured out what was going on, she actually complained to the leaders of the church. She felt that it was inappropriate and it made her uncomfortable. Not long after, Lacey got a job at a daycare and stopped volunteering at the church. She absolutely loved working at the daycare, but it only intensified her obsession with children. And before anyone knew it, she was working from 5.30 in the morning until 6 p.m. at night, Monday through Friday. She was responsible for caring for up to five five babies at a time, and she did it with ease. Lacey also enrolled in Calhoun College and planned to get her nursing degree. On top of all this, she soon began going on casual dates when she wasn't working or attending classes. She met a nice young man named Blake, who was a local police officer. After a few dates, Lacey tried to get intimate with him, which he refused due to being a strict Baptist. That really angered her, and she actually ended their brief relationship publicly. She ran into him at the grocery store and suddenly started screaming at him. She told him that it was over before storming off, and that was the last time she ever really dated. While enrolled at Calhoun, Lacey met a woman that was very close in age to her named Christy, who was the mother of a 10-month-old boy named and Cameron. She befriended Christy and soon the three of them started spending quite a bit of time together. Christy was obviously a young mother and still lived with her parents. They had forbidden her from seeing her son's father, so she had to sneak off and see him in secret. Lacey used this as an opportunity and soon began offering to babysit Cameron for free. Christy thought that Lacey was an absolute blessing. She would buy Cameron the things that he needed like clothes and diapers and never once asked for money back. As she spent more time with him, Lacey even purchased a car seat for her car and a crib. Eventually, Lacey began keeping Cameron overnight while Christy went and spent the night with his father. The the arrangement was working great for everyone, but strangely, Cameron started suffering from unexplained ear infections very suddenly. Obviously, this isn't very uncommon for babies, but it became suspicious because they would heal when Christy kept Cameron home with her. As soon as he returned to Lacey's house, he would get yet another ear infection. He went to various doctors for this several times over the next six months, yet they could not find an explanation. One weekend, Lacey agreed to keep Cameron on Saturday night, and she said she would bring him home the following afternoon. But the following day, Lacey never showed up. Christy tried to get in contact with her multiple times, but received no answer. Christy started to panic and then contacted any mutual friends she had with her, but no one had seen Lacey or Cameron. Thankfully, she was able to track them down the following day at the daycare. Christy was absolutely furious. She told Lacey she could never see Cameron again. Lacey then broke down and started crying, begging Christy not to take Cameron from her. Obviously, her pleas didn't matter, and Cameron was never placed in her care again. Strangely, his ear infection suddenly stopped. Lacey was devastated to not have Cameron in her life, but it didn't take long before she had her sights on another little boy. Lacey had befriended a woman at Jack's named Autumn, who was pregnant with her son Jonathan at the time. She threw Autumn a baby shower and offered her a family discount at the daycare once he arrived. Autumn gladly accepted, given that she was working and attending school. When her classes started ending after the daycare closed, Lacey offered to take the baby home with her until Autumn was done. She again watched him for free and began buying him things he needed out of her own pocket. Autumn was thoroughly impressed with Lacey's apartment. It was covered in toys and anything a baby would need. It actually looked like a daycare in itself. Despite the fact that the only two people living there were 18 and 20 year old women with no children. Autumn deeply trusted Lacey and got so close with her that she considered her to be like a sister. Lacey became incredibly attached to John John as she called him. It got to a point that she would spend as much or more time with him than Autumn was due to her work and school schedule. She would keep John John overnight on Sundays while Autumn went out of town, but Lacey enjoyed his company. She would take him out to stores and to sporting events and eventually began pretending that John John was her own baby. Lacey also started posting him on social media and made it seem like he was hers. She would post hundreds of photos of him on a monthly basis. Lacey wasn't friends with Autumn 
bottom on that particular account, so she had no idea what was being posted. Eventually, someone informed Autumn what Lacey had been posting, and Autumn was a little creeped out about what was going on, but continued to let Lacey watch John John for another two years afterwards. Other people were starting to notice the strange relationship between Lacey and Jonathan, though. When Autumn's mother would pick up Jonathan, she felt that it was strange that Lacey had so many baby items when she had no other children of her own. She also didn't understand how Lacey could afford it. It wasn't until years later that they discovered Lacey was hitting up multiple churches using resources intended for single mothers. Jonathan, like Cameron, had been suffering unexplained chronic ear infections. He was eventually sent to an ear, nose, and throat specialist because the infections were so bad that he actually had pus oozing out of them. It was later determined that he had an unexplained hole in his eardrum. Over the course of the three years that Lacey watched Jonathan, he suffered from 21 ear infections. His family never connected the dots until years later when Lacey was under investigation. In late 2007, Lacey befriended yet another woman that she met at the daycare named Shauna. She had two young sons, a one-year-old named McKelly and a five-year-old named Zach. The two of them hung out a few times outside of the daycare and Shauna thought that John John was Lacey's baby. One day, Lacey asked Shauna if McKelly could spend the night with Jonathan. That one sleepover eventually led to Lacey keeping McKelly and Zach all weekend, every weekend, along with Jonathan. Lacey eventually left Calhoun College and began working at another daycare in the area. She and Shauna became the best of friends. She had a key to Shauna's home and they spent tons of time together. Shauna's husband and family weren't so sure about Lacey's motives though. When Lacey felt Shauna distancing herself, she told her about the abuse that she had endured during her childhood. She claimed that it had recently started up again after her boyfriend, Blake, tragically died in a car accident. That's right, the Blake that she broke up with because he wouldn't sleep with her. She claimed that she and Blake were high school sweethearts, that he was a police officer when he died, and Lacey actually took Shauna to a place that the two had supposedly shared together. Shauna had no reason to question Lacey's story at the time, but she thought it was strange that she had never seen a photo of them together. Shauna just marked it up to grief and moved on. One day in late 2007 or early 2008, Lacey told Shauna that she was pregnant by the family member that was abusing her. Despite being an alleged victim of abuse, Lacey seemed happy to be expecting a baby. Within a few weeks, her stomach began to grow and she even photographed this for her social media accounts. It was around this time that Shauna and Lacey's friendship started to get a little rocky. Shauna's husband and mother were very suspicious of Lacey and were so concerned about her lies and manipulation that they staged an intervention. They told Shauna that she needed to put some distance between the two of them and that she should ask for her house key back. Shauna did so the next time Lacey came to pick up McKelly. She also told Lacey that she would no longer be watching McKelly because it was causing trouble in her marriage. Shauna was sobbing as she told this to Lacey and rather than even trying to be understanding, Lacey completely freaked out. She started screaming and calling Shauna every name in the book before storming out of the house. The two didn't speak for several months, and when they did, it was only on social media. Lacey went on a vacation to Clearwater shortly after their friendship ended, and when she returned, she was no longer pregnant. One evening shortly after her Florida trip, Lacey was trying to set up a baby bassinet and needed some help. She walked downstairs and asked her neighbor, a man named Chris Hill, if he would put it together for her. He agreed, but thought it was strange because she obviously had no children, and also because he had tried to speak to her on multiple occasions, only to be ignored. Anyway, one thing led to another, and she and Chris ended up being intimate that night. And just like that, a brand new relationship was created, if that's what you want to call it. Because she always had John John around, and Lacey's apartment was filled with baby items, she would almost always go down to Chris's apartment to hang out. Chris would cook for her, though she would never eat the food. They'd watch a movie, sleep together, and she would return to her own apartment. Chris made multiple attempts to get Lacey to go on real dates with him, but she was never interested. She refused any attempt that he ever made to take their relationship to the next level. However, they did continue to sleep together despite Chris's claims that Lacey was cold, unaffectionate, and uninterested in the sex. Chris had one child prior to his relationship with Lacey. However, he apparently never learned how important contraceptives are. They never used any form of birth control, so it should have been no surprise a few months later when Lacey announced to him that she was pregnant. It was an unplanned pregnancy, but Lacey was thrilled to be expecting her first child. 
I personally feel that Lacey came across as cold and unaffectionate toward Chris because she wasn't interested in him at all. It's my belief that she decided she wanted to get pregnant and she was going to make that happen no matter what it took. She wasn't interested in Chris as a person. She wasn't even interested in the intimacy. She just saw him as an opportunity to get what she wanted. She recognized that he was attracted to her and in her narcissistic little mind, she thought that she was out of his league and that he would go for whatever she wanted him to do. At one point, she actually described Chris to Shauna as the bald fat man that lived in the apartment beneath her. Chris was an easy target and the only way to get what she really wanted, which was a baby. And a baby is exactly what she got. Chris claims that the moment she told him that she was pregnant, she said that she wanted to get married to him and be a family. Lacey's sister disagrees with that and claims that Chris was the only one that asked Lacey to marry him. She allegedly said that she'd have to think about it and eventually accepted. However it played out, both of them were happy to be expecting a baby. They introduced each other to their families and began acting as a couple throughout Lacey's pregnancy. Chris also started bringing Lacey around his first son, which he initially thought was going to be a great situation given how much Lacey loved kids. He thought she was going to step up and become an instant mother, but Lacey actually reacted in a completely opposite way. She came across as cold toward his son and ignored him as if he was literally not there and didn't exist, which was obviously a red flag for Chris. Throughout her pregnancy, Lacey had hopes for a little boy. She posted this numerous times across her social media accounts. So when the ultrasound confirmed his gender, she was thrilled. I just want to reiterate, she absolutely did not want a girl. I just find it strange that she always grew attached to little boys and wanted only a little boy during her pregnancy. I don't know if that means anything, but it's just an observation. As Lacey's pregnancy progressed, she started to kind of pull away from Chris. The two of them had agreed on the name Caden for the baby, but one day she suddenly decided that it wasn't right. She told Chris that she wanted to name the baby Garnett, but Chris really wasn't a fan. He said he really wanted to stick to the name Caden, and their relationship went downhill from there. Obviously, disagreeing on names is pretty common, but it seems a little crazy that it's worth ending their relationship over. Not only did she end their relationship, but she told Chris that the baby wasn't his and that she no longer wanted him around. Chris believed that the baby was his, and he honestly thought that Lacey would come around eventually. She returned to acting as if he didn't exist and it stayed that way. Garnett Paul Thompson Spears was born on December 3rd, 2008 at a hospital in Huntsville, Alabama, and Chris was not permitted to be there to witness the birth of his own son. Garnett was a healthy baby boy, weighing 6 pounds, 14 ounces at birth. Both Lacey and Garnett were discharged from the hospital after a two-day stay, but it wouldn't be long before Garnett would make his first trip back to the hospital. Two days after they were discharged, so when Garnett was only four days old, Lacey took him back to the hospital, complaining that he was suffering from a high fever and had jaundice. She also claimed that he had been pulling at his ears and she was concerned that he might have an ear infection. Garnett was examined by a pediatrician, but was cleared of any illness. They assumed that Lacey was just a worried first time mother and sent her home. In the weeks after Garnett was born, Chris was really having a hard time. He would sit inside his apartment and listen for car doors so that he could hopefully get a glimpse of his new baby through the window. He would often hear Garnett crying, and at one point, he just couldn't take it any longer. He marched upstairs, beat on Lacey's door, and demanded to see his son. She refused and told him that if he didn't leave her alone, she was going to press harassment charges and get a restraining order. He obviously had his first son to worry about and was afraid to face any legal trouble, so he backed down. He never stopped trying to get a peek of Garnett through the window and never got to know his own son, and I think that's incredibly sad. In the weeks after Garnett's birth, Lacey was absolutely loving the attention that having a baby brought her both online and in real life. She posted hundreds of photos of Garnett and Garnett and John John together, even captioning them brothers. 
However, that attention was short-lived, and Lacey immediately began looking for new ways to draw attention to Garnett. The day after Christmas, Lacey brought him into the emergency room yet again. She had complaints about his ears again, only this time he was dehydrated and the hospital informed her that he would need to receive fluids through an IV. Lacey promptly documented the experience, uploading photos of him with the IV onto her MySpace account. These trips to various medical offices and emergency rooms only became more frequent. In early January of 2009, Lacey once again brought Garnett to both the emergency room and a clinic almost daily, claiming that she was unable to get him to eat properly. She also claimed that he was constantly projectile vomiting and bleeding from both ears. No doctor ever witnessed Garnett vomiting and no one could explain why he was getting such nasty ear infections. Garnett's multiple trips to the ER began raising some red flags for a doctor by the name of Dr. Melissa Young King. She had noticed the excessive visits and thought it was strange that Lacey was so well versed in medical terminology and infant illnesses. She was actually so concerned that she wrote Garnett may be a victim of Munchausen by proxy in his medical file. She also wrote that she observed Lacey get visibly upset when they were unable to find anything wrong with Garnett. And then on January 14th, 2009, Lacey stated she had feelings of wanting to harm her baby. Lacey was referred to the social services department and was later interviewed by a caseworker. Throughout the interview, the caseworker made note that it seemed that Lacey was showing no concern for her baby and was paying no attention to them. After this interview, Lacey suddenly stopped taking Garnett to the hospital and switched to another one. She again told them that he was continuously vomiting and that he wasn't gaining any weight. The new hospital was unaware of the concerns that Dr. Young King had and actually ended up treating Garnett for reflux. The caseworker from the first hospital continued to try and contact Lacey, even showing up at her apartment on numerous occasions, only to be told that she wasn't home by Rebecca. Because they were unable to get in contact with her, they had no choice but to close the investigation. By two months old, Garnett saw a gastroenterologist named Dr. Randall McClellan, who officially diagnosed Garnett with reflux disease and failure to thrive, which for anyone who may not know is just what it sounds like. They diagnosed Garnett with being unable to grow at the rate that he should have been. Once he received this diagnosis, doctors informed Lacey that they could create a small incision in Garnett's stomach and wrap the upper curve of his stomach around his esophagus. This would form a cup which they would sew into place. It was an irreversible procedure and would make it so that Garnett would never be able to throw up ever again. Lacey agreed to the procedure with no hesitation. It went well and Garnett was soon discharged. Only three days later, Lacey and Garnett returned to a clinic that they had previously been and she claimed that he wouldn't eat from his bottle. She said that she had tried breastfeeding and tried the bottle, but he wouldn't take either. They were then sent to Decatur General Hospital, which would be the third hospital in the first two months of Garnett's life. They made the decision to insert a nasal feeding tube into Garnett's nose to ensure he was getting proper nutrition. Lacey took it as an opportunity for a photo shoot, which you will see happen over and over again throughout this video. In fact, if I mention that Garnett was in the hospital or had a procedure done, assume that she was blasting it all over social media so that I don't have to keep repeating it. <laughs> Any chance that she had to get sympathy from friends online, she took it. When Garnett was only nine weeks old, Lacey took him back to Decatur General Hospital yet again, claiming that he would not take his bottle. She stepped out for a moment and a nurse decided to take the opportunity to give Garnett a bottle herself. He took the bottle with no issue, but a few minutes afterward, he became lethargic and unresponsive. Dr. Schuler rushed in to examine him and Lacey made a remark that it was improper formula. They decided to run his labs as his condition worsened and his sodium level was at 180. To put it into perspective, a normal level would be around 135 and 180 is dangerously high, deadly high. Garnett's condition worsened and he was airlifted to the Children's Hospital of Alabama. By that time, he was having seizures and had stopped breathing several times. He was diagnosed with hyperatremia, which basically means that his sodium levels were dangerously high. 
By the time he arrived at the children's hospital, Garnett's sodium level had dropped slightly to 165, which was still dangerously high. He was in shock due to extreme dehydration and was obviously given fluids through IV. Garnett was also put on a spinal tap because doctors were concerned that he may have suffered brain damage. By the next day, his sodium levels had dropped enough that he was finally able to breathe on his own. After a few days, Garnett was transferred out of the pediatric intensive care unit and onto the general floor. He spent the next 11 days in the hospital, and they took it as an opportunity to observe his feedings. Dr. Sarah Tucker, who was a gastrointestinal specialist, conducted multiple feeding evaluations and determined that he had no issues eating on his own. In addition, they ran multiple tests, such as CAT scans and MRIs, to figure out what caused Garnett's sodium levels to spike so rapidly, but they could not find any medical explanation. Everything came back normal. The hospital was highly suspicious of Lacey and believed that she caused his sodium levels to spike to the point that they quarantined Garnett from his mom for four days. During that time, he had no issues eating and didn't attempt to throw up once. He was normal. Dr. Schuler questioned Lacey further and wanted to know exactly what she had been feeding Garnett. Lacey claimed that she was giving him breast milk that was diluted with Pedialyte and water at the recommendation of a pediatrician. She claimed that she was giving him three parts water and Pedialyte and one part breast milk. She stated that other times she would give him half strength formula mixed with Pedialyte. The doctor obviously knew she was lying because any doctor would know that a diet like that would cause malnutrition to an infant. They also believed that she was giving him salt in his formula and that Garnett would be unable to throw it up and get the salt poisoning out of his system. Despite this, no report was ever made and Garnett was discharged and returned to Lacey's care. Shortly after this hospital stay, Lacey was able to get Medicaid for Garnett and filed for supplemental security income due to now having a disabled child. Friends were also starting to notice some red flags about the way that Lacey treated Garnett. Even though he was only a few months old, she had already started lashing out and punishing him. One day while out at lunch, he reached for her food and she hit him on his leg. Another day, she was seen screaming at him as she was trying to put him in his car seat in a Walmart parking lot. The person knew Lacey and thought that it was bad enough that she reported it to social services. However, no investigation was ever started. At six months old, Lacey and Garnett went and had lunch at a Mexican restaurant with a friend, and they thought it was suspicious that Lacey started shoving hot salsa into his mouth despite his stomach issues. Doctors were yet again growing more suspicious of Lacey. She continued to take him in, complaining about the way he was eating and also because he was suffering from chronic ear infections. When a specialist took a look at his ears, they noticed that there were fresh perforations in both ears. When she returned to have them looked at again a few weeks later, there was fresh blood located in the eardrum, even though they should have been healed. Doctors considered that to be unusual, but agreed to put tubes in his ears anyway. They too put it in Garnett's medical file that they believed he may be a victim of Munchausen by proxy, though yet again, no one ever reported it to the authorities. When Garnett was six months old, he and Lacey returned to Decatur General Hospital where he was treated for dehydration. Lacey told them it was from him throwing up, but we know that was impossible because he had the procedure done. During that hospital stay, Lacey and Garnett met a nurse that was on call named Ginger, who tried to befriend Lacey. She felt terribly sorry for her and Garnett and wanted to do what she could to help them. Lacey told her that Garnett had been throwing up, so Ginger took him to her desk with his IV in and fed him with a bottle to see what would happen. She kept him at the desk for approximately two hours so that he would have enough time to digest the formula. He ate just fine and never tried to vomit. So they started to believe that it was an issue with the way that Lacey was feeding him. The nurses tried to educate her, but Lacey seemed more focused on making it seem like he was sick. It was suspected that she would pour water on the bed and call the nurses down there to show them that Garnett had vomited, even though he physically could not vomit but they didn't know that at the time. The hospital contacted the Department of Human Resources multiple times, but once again, no investigation was opened. The hospital did the best that they could to help the situation. They came up with a plan of action and showed Lacey how to care for Garnett. He was discharged, but it wouldn't be long before poor Garnett was returned to Decatur General. This time, he was airlifted again to the Children's Hospital because he was bleeding from his eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. 
He was again put under observation and a report was made to the Department of Human Resources. DHR has since stated that they did receive the report. However, an investigation wasn't open because the hospital didn't report it as child abuse, which is honestly so ridiculous. Way to play the blame game. Nurse Ginger and Lacey started spending time together outside of the hospital. Ginger wanted to keep an eye on Garnett, and I think Lacey liked having a nurse around to absorb more information from. Ginger eventually started babysitting Garnett on her days off and claimed that Lacey really had no idea how to care for him and didn't have a lot of family support. She started inviting Lacey and Garnett over for dinner, and when she would feed him adult food such as green beans and potatoes, he had no issue keeping them down. Eventually, Ginger started keeping Garnett overnight to give Lacey a break, and when she did so, Lacey suddenly stopped showing up to watch John John. She broke off her relationship with him with no problem, and strangely, his chronic ear infection suddenly ended. In August of 2009, Lacey's uncle Bo was diagnosed with cancer, and Lacey decided to take Garnett down to Clearwater to meet him and her grandma Peggy. They had a great visit, and while there, Garnett once again had no issue eating. When they returned to Alabama, Lacey once again started her antics. She claimed that he would go for days without eating and began asking doctors to put in a feeding tube, which would be implanted into his stomach. She asked for this repeatedly. Doctors weren't so sure that it was necessary, so Lacey began hospital hopping until she found a doctor that would agree to do it. Dr. Albert Chong at the Children's Hospital of Alabama agreed to insert the feeding tube due to Garnett being diagnosed with failure to thrive. To be fair, he was small. He wasn't gaining a lot of weight, and they were genuinely concerned for his health, but it still wasn't necessary. The surgery was performed on September 1st, 2009, when Garnett was only 10 months old. Sadly, he would keep the feeding tube his entire life, and it would be the weapon his mother used to end his life. The G-tube changed things for Lacey and Garnett. She now had physical proof that she had a baby who was disabled. She had complete control over what he would eat, and she thrived off the attention that it brought her. It was around this same time that Lacey started telling her friends that she wanted to have another baby boy and named him Granite. Despite the fact that she was a single mother taking care of a disabled little boy and had taken to scamming numerous churches in the area for money, she would church hop with her sister Rebecca and they hit up numerous churches every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday for Bible study. They would go to different women's ministries and she would use Garnett's disabilities to scam them into paying her rent and giving her donated baby items. At one point, she actually went into a church with a fake death certificate claiming that she recently lost her child so that they would help her pay some of her bills. A church actually had to ask her to leave because they believed she would quote, lie, cheat, and steal anything not tied down, end quote. Lacey would lie about conditions that Garnett supposedly had, claiming that he had been born without muscles in his lower stomach. She said he had undergone open heart surgery, had cochlear implants, MRSA, and was deaf, but claimed he could read people's lips at only a year old. By the time he turned a year old, Garnett had been hospitalized 23 times. Lacey continued to use Ginger as a free babysitter, and she noticed some pretty alarming things. She claimed that Garnett always wanted to eat by mouth, but Lacey would only puree fruits and vegetables and feed him through his G-tube. During another incident, Lacey was giving Garnett a bath, then he started to cry when she poured water over his head and it got into his eyes. When he started whining, Lacey became furious, grabbed his head, pushed him under, and held him under the water. Ginger obviously made her stop, and she quickly grabbed Garnett and left with him. She later confronted Lacey about the abuse, and Lacey said she was frustrated about caring for a needy child. These claims are backed up by Lacey's own Facebook post. She posted, quote, Screamed at my child because he screamed at me. Worst of all, I gave him a freezing cold bath because I asked him not to play with the spigot. I've cried, held my little boy as he slept, asked for forgiveness. He is the little person who had to fight and fight with all he had to survive. Man, did I blow it tonight. 
People on her Facebook account were so concerned that they reported the post to DHS. However, no investigation was conducted. Just as everyone in Decatur started to question Lacey's situation, her uncle Bo was placed in hospice care, so she decided to go down to Florida and help her grandmother out for a while. So she and Garnett went down there on a temporary basis. It didn't take long before Lacey befriended her Grandma Peggy's next door neighbor, a woman named Kim Phillipson. She recalls that she first thought Garnett was a little girl because he had beautiful long blonde hair, and she said that Lacey was incredibly shy. She eventually warmed up to Kim and soon was asking her for rides back and forth to the hospice center. Garnett often spent his days over at Kim's house playing with her stepdaughters and she soon realized that he had a feeding tube because Garnett had no issues eating the things that other kids could eat such as scrambled eggs, crackers, and popsicles. Kim never said anything to Lacey about her concerns though because she felt it wasn't really her place and she really liked Lacey. So much, in fact, that she was willing to overlook some of the weird quirks that Lacey had. One day, Lacey came over to Kim's house in a panicked state. She told her she was upset because Grandma Peggy didn't have a computer or Wi-Fi and she needed to get online. From that day forward, Lacey would borrow Kim's laptop every day. She would sit on the front porch with the laptop, ignoring Garnett while he played outside. Eventually, Lacey opened up to Kim about the abuse that she had allegedly suffered, telling her that she had been assaulted by multiple relatives over the years. She also claimed that one of them was Garnett's father, and that he still called her every night to harass her for phone sex all the way from Alabama. One night, Lacey called Kim and told her that, quote, He just won't stop. He has me on the phone all night telling me what he wants to do to me. When Kim suggested that she change her phone number, she stated that she couldn't because she was on a family plan and that the man was never going to stop sending pictures of his penis. After this account, Lacey told Kim that the man was going to be in Florida for a few days and that she was afraid. Not long after that, she claimed that she was pregnant by the family member. Kim obviously felt very terrible for Lacey and wanted to do something to help her friend. She offered to arrange and pay for an abortion and Lacey agreed. So Kim set the appointment up for the following morning and drove across the street to pick Lacey up. And she was shocked because Lacey claimed that she had a miscarriage so she would no longer be needing the abortion which is obviously suspicious timing. Things only got more strange when Lacey started mimicking everything Kim did. At one point, she even chopped her hair off to match Kim's hairstyle exactly, which Kim felt was a little creepy. Kim started to have her guard up with Lacey and began noticing all of the strange and sometimes inconsistent things that she said and did. Tina, Lacey's mother, came down to visit a few months later and Kim couldn't help but notice the dynamic of their relationship. She noticed that Tina was constantly barking orders at Lacey and even physically assaulted her one day when Lacey didn't do exactly what she was told. While all of this was going on, Uncle Bo came home from hospice care so that he could die in his own home. One day, Kim, being the saint that she was, came over to help the family with his care. Tina suddenly got really nasty with Kim, and Grandma Peggy told Kim to leave. In the heat of the moment, Kim blurted out what Lacey had told them about the relative who had assaulted her and was Garnett's father, and that Lacey just had a miscarriage. And as soon as she said that, Peggy told her, quote, Kim, you don't know anything. Lacey has a problem with the truth. So it's very clear to me that Lacey's family had their own suspicions about everything Lacey said and did. However, they sat by and allowed her to abuse her son for the next four years. Uncle Bo eventually passed, and Lacey flew back to Decatur only five days later. While there, she packed all of her and Garnett's belongings, and the two moved to Clearwater on a permanent basis. I'd like to add that during the time all this was going on, the majority of Garnett's medical issues had ceased, aside from his ear infections, conveniently. Anyway, the day before she and Garnett were supposed to fly back, she went on to Facebook and posted that she was feeling suicidal, saying, quote, Isn't happy and doesn't have much of a desire to live anymore. I have been knocked down, beat on, and let down too many times. My heart and soul can't take no more pain and sorrow. I look in the eyes of my son and grandma and know they love me and that my life is for them and them only, but I just can't handle anymore. My every move is controlled by one person and it has to end before it's too late. I'm not sure who that one person was. I'm assuming she meant this alleged abuser, but I believe it was more likely her mother. 
I'd also like to add that while Lacey was packing up her and Garnett's life, Garnett's real dad, Chris, noticed that she was moving out and made a final attempt to be able to meet his son. As soon as he knocked on the door, she threatened to call the cops on him, and he felt he had no option but to turn around and walk away because he didn't have the money to fight for custody. Lacey and Garnett left Decatur the day after Thanksgiving and never turned back. Her uncle Bo had left his money to Peggy and to Lacey, so she was able to buy a brand new car when they got there and she and Grandma Peggy remodeled their home. They converted the back porch into a third room so that Garnett would have a playroom and he spent a lot of time there. He had just turned two and had about every toy you could think of for a little boy. He enjoyed playing with trains, his drum set, and driving his John Deere tractors. Lacey was finally able to buy her own laptop thanks to Uncle Bo's death. So Garnett spent a lot of time outside drawing on the sidewalk, trying to catch as many lizards as he could. You know, the things little boys do. It was around this time Lacey had created multiple accounts to separate people seemingly by the stories that she had told them. She had an account for her family, she had an account for the women's group she was attending, and so on so that she could continue lying without being caught. Shortly after their relocation, Lacey started complaining that Garnett was refusing to eat again and was concerned because she had to feed him through his feeding tube. She soon bought private health insurance and switched Garnett from Medicaid to that insurance. As soon as it began, she started bringing him to various doctors in the area, including an ear, nose, and throat doctor, plus a pediatric gastroenterologist. She also used a lot of Uncle Bo's money to complete expensive home projects and to get new furniture. She and Garnett also drove to Honeymoon Island every day, which is a Florida State Park that offers miles of white sand beaches. They would build sand castles and spend their days in the water. They would often eat lunch at Frenchie's, which is a local bar and grill that is extremely popular. I've eaten there personally and I highly recommend it. Anyway, they were really living their best lives and she would document this over all of her social media accounts. But their lifestyle started to raise some eyebrows. Lacey was constantly talking about how sick Garnett was to anyone who would listen, while at the same time taking him to the beach every single day. People couldn't understand how all that was safe for him when his health was so bad. As she settled in and got comfortable with her Florida lifestyle, Lacey began attending attachment parenting groups in Clearwater. According to Google, attachment parenting is a parenting philosophy that uses methods to promote the attachment of parent and infants. It focuses on empathy and responsiveness, as well as continuous bodily closeness and touch. The groups she began attending were called the Mom Circle and the Consciously Parenting Project. She used these groups to connect with other women and they served as a breeding ground for Lacey's wild stories. She often described just how hard her life was because she was raising Garnett all by herself when he was so sick. Lacey wanted sympathy for the circumstances that she created herself. She was the one who shut his dad Chris out, and as we'll see later, it's likely that she was also the one that was making Garnett so sick. Lacey started taking him to a doctor by the name of Dr. Holly Johantkin, who practiced oriental medicine and specialized in pediatrics. Oriental medicine is a medical system that has been used for thousands of years to prevent, diagnose, and treat disease, and keeps a person's spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical health in balance. Oriental medicine aims to restore the body's balance and harmony between the natural opposing forces of yin and yang, which can actually block qi and cause disease. Oriental medicine includes acupuncture, diet, herbal therapy, meditation, physical exercise, and massage. Lacey also befriended a holistic health consultant named Mika. For those that don't know, holistic health isn't really healthcare, but it's actually an approach to life. They focus on how a person interacts with their environment, and it emphasizes the connection of a person's mind, body, and spirit. Mika eventually recommended a vegan, plant-based diet for Garnett that she believed would help resolve his gastric issues. Lacey started administering this diet to Garnett through his G-tube and became quite obsessive about what he was eating. She soon made an announcement about it on Facebook and said, quote, I'm a co-sleeping, baby-wearing, breastfeeding, rear-facing, organic, all-natural, attached parenting mama, done with modern medicine, one week of herbs, and I've seen all the proof I need. She no longer believed in antibiotics or vaccinations, but despite this, she soon brought Garnett into his pediatrician, Dr. Hull. 
because once again, he had a severe ear infection. Dr. Hole would continue to treat Garnett for the next year for multiple ear infections and issues related to failure to thrive, while Lacey was claiming online that the holistic medicine was a miracle for Garnett. She asked Lacey to have his medical records sent over from Alabama numerous times, but Dr. Hole never once saw them. So she had absolutely no idea the concerns that the previous hospitals had about the possibility of Munchausen by proxy. In May of 2011, despite the holistic medicine working so miraculously, Lacey took Garnett to Dr. Lenski in St. Petersburg, who placed tubes in both of Garnett's ears due to his constant ear infections. She also prescribed eardrops that needed to be used to help heal his ears after the tubes were put in. However, Lacey refused to administer them. She ended up having the tubes removed from his ears approximately two weeks later. So basically it was for nothing. As she was documenting all of this on social media, people that knew her were becoming increasingly concerned. Lacey posted that she wasn't going to be using the proper medication and that she didn't believe in Western medicine. And people thought she wasn't taking care of Garnett the way she should be. Someone on one of her Facebook accounts decided to call the Florida Department of Children and Family Services and they opened an investigation on June 1st, 2011. The call was anonymous, but they stated that they were worried about Garnett being in and out of the hospital constantly. Yet, Lacey took him to the beach daily and to other outings almost constantly. A social worker showed up to the home that Lacey and Peggy shared so that they could investigate. Peggy answered the door and told them that Lacey wasn't home, but Garnett was. Peggy called Lacey and told her to get home right away. The caseworker wrote in their report that Garnett was free of any marks or bruises and he was wearing a turquoise diaper. They also wrote that Peggy said that Lacey was doing a good job of caring for Garnett and that he was being seen by several doctors. But DCF had no idea that Peggy also disagreed with Garnett's new diet. Given that she lived with them, she was able to recognize that Garnett really was able to eat food with no problem but couldn't due to Lacey's extreme beliefs about the holistic diet. Grandma Peggy was no longer allowed to bake cookies or cakes, and he wasn't allowed to enjoy snacks that most kids would eat. She felt that it was not only unfair to Garnett, but was also worried that it would be detrimental to his health. It caused a lot of tension in their household, but ultimately Peggy backed down, and she didn't say anything about it to DCF either. Lacey told the same story and that she was treating him with herbs and antibiotics. The caseworker noted that Lacey had a good support system and that all was good. Of course that was their determination. She was white and she looked like she had money. Because that equals good parenting. The same evening, Lacey took to Facebook and said that she was going to create a blog to document Garnett's healing journey so that everyone could follow along with his progress. I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but it's almost comical how obvious it was and that this was her version of a f you to whoever called DCF on her. And she did end up creating a page on Facebook called Garnett's Journey, which was the third Facebook account that she ever had, as well as a blog with the same title. But we'll talk more about that a little later. There was a second report made to DCF within a few weeks. And the person stated, quote, Garnett has lost 50% of his hearing and bleeds from his ears, nose, and eyes. His mom will slap him for no reason as hard as she can. He begins to cry so that she can hug him. DCF didn't believe that person and didn't take the report seriously because they believed that the person had, quote, never met Garnett, had not seen Lacey in more than three years, and heard these details third hand. So awesome. Definitely encourages people to report abuse. Not long after the report to DCF, Lacey took Garnett back to Dr. Hole because he had yet another ear infection, as well as an infection in his G-tube site. She posted on Facebook that she was having herbs overnighted because Garnett's ears weren't doing well. She continued to post about his condition deteriorating and made it seem that the situation was really bad. She had posted that due to his ear infection, Garnett was running a fever of 103 degrees. Imagine everyone's shock when Lacey posted photos of Garnett playing on the beach only a few hours afterward. This incident was also reported to DCF, so they had received three reports within a two-week period. Yet, they did absolutely nothing other than contact Tina Spears, who obviously stuck up for her daughter. 
In July of 2011, the Florida Department of Children and Family Services received yet another anonymous call. This time, it was because the person believed that Lacey was not seeking medical attention for Garnett. They told the caller that the allegations were being addressed, and that was that. Everything came to a head a week later when Lacey went into the Child Protective Investigation Unit in Clearwater to address the allegations against her. She met with an investigator and recapped Garnett's medical history. The caseworker noted that Garnett was small and didn't appear to have any issues with his ears because he had good speech. The investigator told her to put Garnett on a proper diet and told her that she needed to schedule an appointment with a pediatric doctor. Three days later, the investigation was officially closed and Lacey was cleared of any medical neglect or abuse against Garnett. They wrote in the report that they didn't think they needed to intervene any further. However, they were concerned she wasn't following up with his medications and the holistic diet. Once again, they noted that Lacey appeared to have a good support network. I've seen that phrase in so many cases and a child ends up dead. It's infuriating to me because it's obvious that having a good support system on the surface has never stopped someone from harming their child if they choose to. Many families and even friends sit by and observe abuse occurring without ever taking any action. And that's because there can sometimes be a fine line between discipline and abuse. And many people feel it's not their place to tell someone how to parent. And I think that's bullshit. Having a support system doesn't stop someone from being evil. The following month, so in August of 2011, Florida DCF was contacted again. The caller claimed that Lacey wasn't following up on doctor's recommendations and that Garnett was losing weight because of the diet that she had him on. Another investigation was opened and they actually found that her lack of action likely contributed to his weight loss. They determined that Garnett was at risk because of his age and because of his long medical history. But then the case was closed again and no action was taken. So four reports where nothing was done. The same month, Lacey began working as a nanny for a fellow mom at our attachment parenting group named Jessica Wilson. She felt sorry for Lacey because she claimed that she had a brain tumor and Crohn's disease in addition to dealing with Garnett's medical problems. Jessica told her that she could relate because she was also suffering from celiac disease and soon Lacey developed that disease as well. While all of these DCF investigations were going on, Lacey's head was elsewhere. She had decided that she wanted to have another baby and quickly became obsessed with the idea. Lacey had talked in great detail about her life with Blake, whom she was now claiming was Garnett's father to her Florida friends. She claimed that they were high school sweethearts and were living together. He was a police officer but died in a tragic car accident the year before. And now she and Garnett were living without him. This gained a ton of sympathy from the women of the group, so much so that when Lacey was boo-hooing about wanting another baby, this woman offered to let Lacey have sex with her husband so that Garnett could have a sibling. Lacey began sleeping with her husband so that she could try and conceive another baby, but the situation was short-lived when the man's wife, Lacey's friend, got jealous. They all agreed to a threesome which ultimately ended their friendship, thankfully before she got pregnant. Garnett celebrated his third birthday in December of 2011. And Lacey made note of how she had watched his health slowly but surely be restored. In January of 2012, his ear infection started back up again. Instead of taking him to the doctor for antibiotics, Lacey treated them with breast milk. She eventually took him into Dr. Jan Arango, who diagnosed him with double ear infections, which are apparently rare. Not long afterward, Garnett developed a tooth infection, and when Lacey brought him into the dentist, they told him that his oral hygiene was poor and that he needed fluoride treatment and crowns, which she then refused because she didn't believe in it. She continued to refuse treatment even though he was unable to eat or sleep because he was in such intense pain. Next, Lacey claimed that Garnett was suffering from a spinal disorder accompanied by yet another ear infection. When that didn't receive enough attention, she started making claims that she felt suicidal because she didn't know how much longer she could live without Blake. Soon after, in May of 2012, Garnett allegedly fell down in Lacey and Peggy's kitchen, which pushed his tooth up into his gum. When taken to the dentist, it was determined that Garnett's other front tooth was also severely infected to the point that both teeth had to be removed. 
Rather than be embarrassed by the fact that she had neglected her child's teeth so severely that they had to be removed, Lacey took it as an opportunity to fabricate a story and gain sympathy for her on social media. She posted that Garnett had osteomyelitis in his jaw, which is an infection, and she claimed she was concerned it was going to go to his brain, so she decided to actually give him the antibiotics that the doctor had prescribed. By this point, Lacey's lies about Blake were growing larger and larger. She actually joined a few survivor websites so that she could discuss losing Blake in more thorough detail. She soon befriended an older woman who had obviously lost someone. The two began private messaging, and the woman asked Lacey for her life story, and she was in for a treat. The message read, May not be able to write it all out tonight, but I'll start. On December 28, 2007, my partner and I gave birth to a beautiful baby boy named Grayson Grayer, who never made it Earthside. A few short weeks later, I became pregnant with Garnett. His brother and him were born less than a year apart. The hurt, unknown fears of being pregnant again so soon separated their father and I. I raised G alone until he was nearly one. G was 6 pounds 14 ounces at birth and by the time he was 9 weeks old he was 3.4 pounds. He was unable to hold food down. He had emergency stomach surgery to save his life. His organs had began to shut down. However, the hospital who did his surgery did it wrong, gave him the wrong amounts of fluid and his sodium levels began to rise. He started having seizures, stopped breathing, was med flighted to Tennessee where he spent the next 14 weeks of his life on life support. I never once was able to hold him for 14 long weeks. Babies and children need touch, connection. Once she was off life support, we were moved onto the floor where we stayed for another two months. During these months, I battled to feed G. If he ate, I had to use a syringe to feed him. In September 2009, Garnett got a G tube, and that is how he eats 90% of the time now. After getting his eating slash reflux under control, we began to battle MRSA. He was and still bleeds from his ears, eyes, and nose. Finally, in September of 2010, when G was nearly two, I was told he needed to have his intestines cut out from all the medicines he had been on. Wasn't working for me. G was 21 months old and 16 pounds. So his father and I decided I would leave with him and come to Florida. I fought every day to keep him alive until April of last year when I had the opportunity to meet a Dom, doctor of oriental medicine, who yes, saved his life. G went on a special diet and began to take herbs instead of mainstream medicine. Within two weeks, there were signs of improvement. He doesn't eat gluten, dairy, meat, sugar of any form, soy, any processed foods, vinegar. All his food is organic. He still battles infection. Takes time for your battles to heal. Just in the last few weeks, he began a cancer prevention diet, or really it is a diet that has been known to cure any form of cancer. No, he doesn't have cancer, but the diet heals the body like no other medicine can. People with final stages of brain cancer, women with breast cancer, have been cured within weeks. So that was our life until September. September 3rd, I lost my daughter, Journey, at 23 weeks. 33 days later, my best friend and son's father was killed in an auto accident. My life stopped on that October night. I struggled to place one foot in front of the other. I often feel robbed of Garnett's first two and a half years of life, and now I feel robbed of this part of his life. That's our journey. Today we add more to it. G has been in the hospital 33 times thus far, med flighted two times, and had 12 surgeries for various things to do with the MRSA, his stomach, and ears. In addition to everything Lacey had written on those message boards, she also continued to confide in Rebecca Thompson, the founder of one of the mommy groups she went to. Lacey told her that it was torturous living without Blake and that life was just too hard, claiming she broke down every time Garnett screamed for his daddy. And by the way, she was telling Garnett that Blake was his dad. So Garnett believed that his dad died. On the eight month anniversary of Blake's fake death, she wrote, Eight months ago today, an innocent life was taken by a careless driver who ran a red light. Eight months ago, a fiance, father, son, best friend, soulmate, and the person I spent almost 21 years of my life knowing was killed. I have no idea where this journey has taken him or what his journey looks like. I do know that I miss him, his connection, his love, the sound of his voice, the security he brought to our lives. He has a son that will grow up without his physical presence, and I have no idea how I will survive without my best friend and soulmate. 
Life without him is a nightmare that never ends, a form of torture, and today is certainly no different. There is no beauty, no happiness, no joy. Life is raw, unbearable, and utterly pointless. Another day she wrote, Life without you is bizarre and unnatural. I miss the scent of your pillowcases, the way you would wrap your arms around me at every opportunity just to hold me close. The sound of your laughter that filled the walls of our home. I miss you, Blake, and I will love you always. Okay, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to January of 2013, when Lacey told her holistic doctor that she thought she had cancer, but she feared that she may be making herself sick for no reason. It's very clear that Lacey had a flair for the dramatic and was able to come up with great details for her own versions of reality. She was willing to do and say anything to get the attention that she so desperately craved. In the conversation that she had with Rebecca, Lacey also said quote I don't want to be a mother to G anymore I suck as his mother I cry scream put him in timeout don't play with him can't understand what he needs most of the time I'm over it I'm over life I just need a hug one person to try and understand in the same conversation she asked Rebecca to tell dr. Holly the holistic doctor about all of the abuse that she had endured saying quote tell her what happened I was raped five long years pregnant at 17 I was a junior in high school had an abortion against my will what else was I to do by this point many people that Lacey knew around the Clearwater area were becoming more aware of her manipulation lies and ability to be downright cruel at times Kim, the next door neighbor, became increasingly concerned about her character. Lacey had gotten Garnett a little wiener dog named Odie a few months prior and eventually began locking the dog in their garage for hours at a time in the Florida heat. Kim said that the dog would bark loudly and it sounded as if he were screaming and crying to be let out. In August of 2013, Odie was found dead under a neighbor's window under mysterious circumstances. Lacey couldn't seem to keep her story straight, telling some people that he had drowned in the bath tub and others that Odie had eaten a poisonous frog. Poisonous frogs are a threat to pets in Florida, but it's much more uncommon than an animal dying from a heat stroke in the Florida heat. In August, the average temperature is anywhere between 80 and 100 degrees. So it's likely that the temperature in a garage would be anywhere from 90 to 100 degrees on any given day. According to this chart, even 75 degrees would be potentially unsafe for a dog as small as Odie was. Also, if the dog drowned in a bathtub, how how is it that he ended up being found underneath a neighbor's window? In my opinion, I think that the dog died in the garage and was placed under the window by Lacey so that she could explain the situation away and it wouldn't look like it's her fault. It's a shame that no one who heard the dog crying tried to report her because his life could have been spared. Kim wasn't the only one taking notice of all of Lacey's inconsistencies. Many red flags were being raised in the women's groups that she was attending. It got to a point that Lacey had exaggerated so much and told so many lies that she was having a hard time keeping them straight from one person to another. At one point, she claimed to be having a miscarriage even though she had never mentioned being pregnant and her actions during that time were not typical for someone who was pregnant. She would go on and on about having a brain tumor, being suicidal, and so on. When another member of the group would discuss an illness that they were suffering from, Lacey would wait a few weeks before suddenly claiming that she also had that illness. Her lies were starting to catch up to her at home and at her nanny job as well. Lacey had been caught stealing clothing from the family she was nannying for her, and they were starting to get suspicious because their daughter continuously refused to take a bottle from Lacey. She eventually started having unexplained gastric problems as well as ear infections while in Lacey's care. The final straw came on a day that their daughter's eyes were burned from getting icy hot ointment in them while Lacey was watching her. When they demanded answers on how this could happen, Lacey didn't have anything to say. They let her go and their daughter's gastric and ear problems miraculously stopped, yet she was never reported. Grandma Peggy had also started really questioning the way Lacey was feeding Garnett. She didn't agree with Lacey about his diet and saw that it was actually doing more harm than good. The two started having heated arguments over the situation and Lacey claimed that it was because her grandmother didn't understand and was too controlling, but Peggy told 
different story to her friends. She claimed that the arguments that the two were having is because Lacey would become incredibly jealous over the relationship that Peggy had with her great-grandson and that Lacey didn't like when the attention wasn't focused on her. When things got tough in Clearwater and people started to figure out that there was something not quite right, Lacey did exactly what she did in Alabama. She packed up her and Garnett's life and she ran from the problems she was facing. Okay, just to backtrack a little bit, Lacey discovered a school called the Suncoast Waldorf School, which was located in Palm Harbor, Florida. Friends of Rebecca Thompson named Jack and Nicole told Lacey all about the school and that they believed it would be a good place for Garnett to attend, although he was a bit too young at the time. According to the Suncoast Waldorf School's website, they are a holistic school that provides pre-K through eighth grade education. They also have a curriculum for three to six year olds that is quote, built upon imagination, physical development, and fostering social skills, which is done in a safe, gentle, and nurturing environment. Nicole told Lacey that she was familiar with schools that were in Maryland and Pennsylvania, but that they had schools located all over the world. The school certainly piqued Lacey's interest, and in July of 2012, she began researching the Waldorf schools further. That's when she discovered the Green Meadow Waldorf School that is located in Chestnut Ridge, New York. The school was actually on the grounds of a community called The Fellowship. According to their website, The Fellowship community is a work-based, intergenerational community centered on the care of the elderly. The community sits on a large farm with woods and orchards about 30 miles northeast of New York City. Its members are made up of elderly people, co-workers as they call them, and their children. The site says that it's a quote, place for people who are interested in self-development by working and learning in service to others and caring for the earth. Everyone at the fellowship, young and old, is working and learning to become her or his truest self to best serve the human community. Lacey was very interested in the fellowship community and made the decision to apply there when she discovered that in exchange for working for the fellowship, Garnett's tuition at the Waldorf and room and board would be completely covered. At this point in the video, this really shouldn't even have to be said, but Lacey lied and exaggerated on her application about Garnett's health, claiming that he had no current medical needs. While she was telling other people that he had a red blood cell disorder and that only 75% of his liver was working and that he needed to have his spleen removed, which by the way, he later donated when he died. They conducted an interview and contacted her references, but Lacey didn't hear back from the fellowship right away. Toward the end of the summer in 2012, Rebecca Thompson and introduced Lacey to executive members of the fellowship named Matt and Elizabeth Uppenbrink while they were in Clearwater visiting family. They were so touched by Garnett's story and by what Lacey had to say that they actually invited her to join the fellowship right then and there. And she did. Three months later, just as all of her lies were about to blow up in her face, the stress of her lies starting to come out and preparing for the move started to really weigh Lacey down. And she once again started making claims that she was feeling in October, Lacey took to Facebook to mourn the death of her fake fiance, claiming that she would write a new fact about him every day for the next year so that she could print it and save it for Garnett, which seems like a long commitment for something that was a lie, but she had the time, I guess. I also wanted to add that around the one year anniversary of Blake's fake death, she started telling Garnett that his dead daddy came back as an owl so that he could watch over them. She then proceeded to fill their entire house with owl decorations to constantly remind him of that. The people that had concerns about Lacey's parenting could no longer sit by and let it happen. Unaware that Lacey was planning to move to New York in just a few months, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department started investigating Lacey. They had received multiple anonymous complaints about her parenting. The child abuse unit made several attempts to contact Lacey and conduct interviews with her. She would agree to be interviewed several times, but either didn't show up for the appointment or would call and cancel at the last minute, which should have been a red flag, but apparently was overlooked. Within two weeks of them contacting her, she and Garnett flew to New York and moved into the fellowship community. She actually tried to leave within the same week that the investigation was opened, but their flights were canceled due to Hurricane Sandy. People were shocked when Lacey suddenly announced that she and Garnett were packing up to go to New York because it seemingly came out of nowhere. People actually praised her because she presented the situation like, this is where Garnett is gonna have the best life. I made the ultimate sacrifice for my child. And a fundraiser 
was even created to help with moving expenses, which had over $800 in it by the time they moved. Lacey told Kim that she was leaving Florida because she was tired of Grandma Peggy trying to control the way she parents Garnett, and she didn't want to hear her criticism any longer. Allegedly, Peggy was always telling Lacey to stop being controlling over Garnett and what he ate because it was out of control. It really makes me question whether some of the anonymous reports to the Sheriff's Department and DCF were actually from Peggy. She lived with them, so she would have seen any abuse going on. Maybe afraid of upsetting others in the family, she called anonymously, hoping that they would help Garnett. But that's just my theory. And that concludes part one. I'll have part two up shortly after this is posted. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, remember the name, Casey Shane. I'm out.